the exclusive. What really happened from the classroom to the hotel room to their own home? In your son's bed. In my son's bed. And for the first time, the surveillance videos from inside the school, the hotel, and the selfies the teacher took with the boy of them kissing. This evening, new outrage for those parents after learning that teacher's fate. That's it. She just crossed the line. Also tonight, the beautiful daughter who looked nothing like her father. Suddenly, the entire family finds out why. And it said that they shared zero DNA. Duped at a fertility clinic, it wasn't dad's DNA, it was the lab techs. And he gave me this just sort of evil smile. And tonight, is that worker the father to hundreds of children? This is so creepy. The 2020 investigation. And a very personal note about our friend, our colleague, and her brave journey. What Elizabeth revealed today about her own private struggles. The amount of energy I expended keeping that secret was exhausting. Tonight, Elizabeth is back. Here now, David Muir and Elizabeth Vargas. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us tonight. And let me just say, it is great to have you back. It's great to be back. And thank you for all your support. And thank you to all our viewers as well. It really meant a lot to me. And I'll be talking a little bit later in the program about where I've been and the work I've done and, and share a little bit about that. And so. a member of your family is here tonight. I know. This is a very brave evening for you, and we know that. Uh, and we'll get to all that a little later. I know you want us to start with the news yes, first. let's go. So let's begin. We begin here tonight with that headline that rocked the city of Houston this week. The pretty middle school teacher and the boy whose parents trusted the teacher to help him. Instead, what would follow would be any parent's nightmare. Tonight, the parents and that boy sitting down only with 2020. Our new developments in the case of a local middle school teacher caught having sex with a child. Late today, she received her punishment. It's the story thrust back into the spotlight just this week. After the first headlines shocked much of Houston, a parent's nightmare come true. He's a child. That's what the law said. A married school teacher they had trusted with their son was having sex with him. And tonight, for the first time, the secret that began in classroom 308 is finally unraveling. Alex and Jenny Pillay will never forget that first day at Memorial Middle School, one of the top schools in Houston, bringing their son to that front door, newly adopted, rescued from distant relatives from a life of poverty in Costa Rica. They began the adoption process when he was just nine years old. It took five years to get him here. Do you remember the trip to go get him, to bring him to America? Oh, definitely, and he was so excited. Oh my God, this is my new, my new life. His new life in America? In America. When we arrived to, to Houston, and he was so surprised, amazing, looking at the buildings, how tall the buildings were, and he was so happy to be at his new home. And soon, his new school. I walked Jimmy to school. He was very nervous. Do you remember your first day of school? I didn't like it. So you walked into that school not speaking a word of English? No. And you just, hello, and that's it. You said to Jimmy, you will survive this. Oh, yes. It will get better. It will get, it better. Will get better. The boy came to America with.
big dreams of playing soccer, of college one day. One of his first trips to NASA with his new parents. This is the young face of the boy who was also getting help at his new school. There was an English teacher assigned to give him that extra help with his classes, 28-year-old Catherine Camille Murray, who was married. Some of the boys thought Ms. Murray was pretty. Do you remember the first time you met her? Yes. Was she nice? Yes, yeah, she was nice. She started helping me a lot with my homework. Jimmy found comfort in her classroom. You would take all your other classes and then you would go to her at the end of the day for help or sometime during the day for yes. help? Yes. I started liking the feeling that I was feeling for her. The teacher and student were growing closer. When do you start hearing about Ms. Murray? We went to the open house and I said, hello, Ms. Murray, I'm Jimmy's mom. And immediately she looked at me and says, oh, uh, Jim is my favorite student, and he's so well behaved. Really? That struck you as strange? I thought it was kind of strange. And what was Jimmy saying about Ms. Murray at home? Oh, she's so pretty. And I said, yeah, she's a pretty lady. Hey, every kid goes through that. Mm -hmm. It's a crush on the teacher. So you're thinking this is our adolescent son. This is an adolescent son with just a simple crush. That's it, but nothing of it. And in all of his classes, Jimmy is getting A's and B's. So it was like, okay, so she's, she's actually doing good for him, helping him. But there was more. At school, Jimmy says there was something about the way she would look at him. When you would walk into that room, would she smile? She looked me different. She looked at you differently? Yes. Is that when you sensed that she had feelings for you too? Mm -hmm. Yes. Before Christmas break, he writes a note revealing his love for his teacher, but then tears it up into pieces and gave it to her to throw away. Instead, she keeps the letter, and when he returns to school, a surprise. She said, I read your letter. She put it back together. Yes, and she told me, I really like you, for real. <laughs> and so, I really like you, and she, she told me, I know, but we can have anything. Or, she told you you yes. couldn't have anything. Jimmy is staying after school nearly every day now. Then one afternoon, he doesn't come home from school. His parents frantically begin looking for him through the empty hallways everywhere. Even classroom 308, his father finds the custodian. And we saw the custodian lady and she said, they were just here, they left. There was no sign of him. Suddenly, Jimmy appears at home. Holding his arm like this. With blood. He couldn't, he had no words. And as soon as he spoke, it just started crying. He would cry for nearly an hour and then offer a story. Jimmy told his parents he'd been in the car with Ms. Murray and they had an argument. He just told us that he was in the car, he jumped out of the car. So it's like, what happened? And the only thing he said was, I told her that I like her. And my wife and I are looking at each other, okay, so this sounds like a lover's quarrel. They immediately reach out to Ms. Murray, but she mentions nothing about Jimmy in her car. So at that moment, you think there's something going it's on. It's going on. She is lying. They tell Ms. Murray their son needs to be taken out of her class. She says she'll move him. Weeks go by, life at home returns to normal. Every night, Every you night. sit down at the dinner we, table. We all four sit at the dinner. Yeah. And he'd stop talking about yes. Ms. Murray. Yes, stop talking about Ms. We thought, okay. We thought it was over but it was far from over. They were now talking on Facebook. Jimmy says he messaged Ms. Murray that he wanted to kiss her and that she replied, I want to see that. She wanted you to kiss her. Yes. Monday, I came to my school early. I walked straight to her and I kissed her. When I stopped kissing her, I walked to my first class. You were thinking to yourself, you had to get back to her. Yes. So you went back to her. You asked her how she felt about what happened. Yes, and she told me, okay, I want, I want you to kiss me again, so that's when I kissed her again. That's when everything started? Yes. Physically? Mm-hmm. Did she ever say to you, this is wrong? Not after I kissed her. And tonight here, look at this. For the first time on 2020, the school surveillance tapes showing the teacher meeting privately in her classroom behind closed doors over and over again with her middle school student. She can be seen scanning the hallway, sometimes walking out with Jimmy, other days, they leave in different directions. While at home, what Jimmy's parents think is a welcome sign, the school dance. And Jimmy wants to go with the friends he's now made. No sign of Ms. Murray. And are you hoping that Jimmy's gonna find a girl his own age to have a crush on? Of and course. Of course. But the girl waiting at the dance, Ms. Murray, across the street from the school, 
in the church parking lot. His dad had no idea. I dropped him off and he saw me leaving and then he moved on over to meet her at, across the street. And she's waiting in, of all places, the church across the street. Yes. So you would talk to Ms. Murray during the day. You said my dad's gonna bring me to the dance and the two of you had a plan. Yes. The boy she'd been warned to stay clear of, she was now taking away from that school dance. She had her own playlist. Tonight, 2020 obtaining the video, the images the night she checked into a nearby hotel, then bringing her teenage student through that side door. Did anything happen in the hotel? Yes, we have sexual relations. You had sex with her? Yes. A secret the teacher helped Jimmy keep, but not for long. Suddenly, a disturbing phone call from the principal. He confided yeah. in the yeah. another teacher that yeah. he had kissed Ms. Murray. Yes. That I kissed Ms. Murray. Yes. That's correct. And then the selfies, the photographs they took of themselves kissing, images that would break a mother's heart. And tonight, for the first time here, we see them after becoming a key part of this case. Then another major blow. Jimmy and his mother sitting together when suddenly the mother's cell phone goes off. She'd let Jimmy borrow it, and that teacher, Ms. Murray, was now texting Jimmy. But the mother was receiving the message. The teacher's message, you know I love you. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to be happy together. I miss you. A mother looking down at her cell phone, stunned. I said, Jimmy, I need to go to the restroom. I had to put water on my face. And I said, okay, this is not happening. And that mother had not even heard the worst of it. When we come back, all of this, suddenly, it's much closer to home. He says, mama has something to tell you. That smile you have in your face is going to go away when I tell you this. You won't believe where this goes next. Twenty continues with David Muir. It's a hall of shame filled with unlikely faces, female teachers entrusted to protect, who instead preyed on their male students. Names like Deborah Lafave, convicted of abusing a 14-year-old, Mary Kay Latorno, who had sex with her 12-year-old student. She famously told the world their love was real. I felt a very deep love for him. And tonight, at the head of that infamous class now, Ms. Murray. 28, married, and sleeping with the boy who had just come to America with his new parents and his new dreams. And for that mom who so tried to protect him, it was all crashing down. That text that came to her phone, the teacher, thinking she was texting Jimmy, saying, I love you, I miss you. And now her younger son at home was troubled too. Something wasn't right. So your, your youngest son isn't leaving his room? No. For days. And when the younger brother, just 12 years old, finally emerged from his bedroom, his mother could not believe what he told her. Fernando came to me and says, Mama has something to tell you. I said, what is it? He says, that smile you have in your face is going to go away when I tell you this. She was here. I said, what do you mean she? Who is she? He says, Catherine Moore was here. I said, what? He says, Mom, they had sex. The little brother had stumbled in on them while looking for the family dog. He says, I saw her bra and I saw a couple of condoms on the floor. The teacher had been in their own house. This notion that this teacher would come into your home and get into your son's bed with him. I mean, this is just sick. This was now an outraged mother on a mission. And I said, I need to prove this person was in my house. That's it. She just crossed the line. I put some gloves and I took everything I can take from my son's bedroom. All the covers, pillows, and I called the police. And I say, okay, do the DNA. Let's prove she was here or not. And it was positive. Yeah, DNA from those sheets proved that she was there. This is the same teacher who <laughs> weeks and weeks before you had called the school and said, keep her away from my son. Yes. The same teacher they had once thanked for helping their son who spoke so little English. I keep sending emails. Thank you for taking care of my son. Thank you for care about my son. Now armed with the teacher's DNA, the case moves quickly. 15-year-old Jimmy and his 12-year-old brother suddenly swept into it, sitting across from investigators. Jimmy determined to protect his teacher. So you've been brought to a room where investigators were asking you yes. what happened. My brother went first, and then me. I started lying. I started saying, I just kissed her. The investigator said to you they already knew the truth. Yes. And I said, okay, and I started telling the truth. I said, 
Yes, I had relationship with her and we had sex. Miss Murray is quickly arrested and charged with sexual assault of a child. She's released on bail, but ordered to stay away from Jimmy. And there is relief at Jimmy's house. He's now back at school, captain of the soccer team, and the family is back at the dinner table. Months would go by, he begins to open up to his mother. He started to tell yeah, you piece by piece how soon. Details, very hard details for Manta here. He tells her that it wasn't just their house or that hotel, that the sex had all started in that classroom, room 308. And not only does he tell his mom, he tells police, who start scouring that surveillance video all over again, looking for even more evidence, and there it is. Jimmy leaving Ms. Murray's classroom on the afternoon he says they first had sex. Just six minutes later, watch as Ms. Murray comes out of that same room. School surveillance showed that they were leaving her classroom on Tuesday, February 7th at 5.15 p.m. And the school records show that school is regularly dismissed at 3.30 p.m. Ms. Murray is now charged with two more counts of sexual assault on a child and one count of an improper relationship with a student. She is ordered now to wear an ankle bracelet. And as the months go by, those parents are learning more and more about how they say Ms. Murray lured their son in. Jimmy's dad reads to me the notes prosecutors say the teacher wrote to their son. So this is a poem she wrote to your son? That is correct. And what does it say? It says, because of you, I crave, I desire, I hope, I learn, I love, and because of you, I do not hate myself. This is from the teacher This is from the teacher to my son. And after all they'd been through, all they had learned, their son, suddenly seemed to be pulling away yet again. Unbelievably, it was back on. Jimmy had started secretly seeing Ms. Murray. Were you thinking to yourself, I shouldn't be doing this? Yes. But when you saw her? All the feelings that I felt for her came by. His parents now suspect that even with that ankle bracelet and facing a possible 20 years in prison, that Ms. Murray was still toying with their son's emotions. These parents were in tune with their son. Absolutely. They hire a private investigator to follow him. And that very night, sitting out front, the investigator sees Jimmy leap through a window in the middle of the night, a friend driving him. That investigator taking us back along that fateful route. I was following down the freeway. I'm thinking, wow, this is really happening. Wow, those parents knew exactly what they were saying. They knew this teacher hadn't stopped. I said, okay. The private eye suddenly finding herself in front of Ms. Murray's father's house. How quickly do you call Houston police? Once I saw Jimmy get out of the car and go inside, I picked up the phone and called the HPD number and told them that I was working on a case involving Ms. Murray, and they recognized the name instantly. She calls Jimmy's parents, too. As we're driving to the Ms. Murray's father's house, I'm calling the police. I'm saying, I'm the father. This is the case number, and when we got there, there were seven police cars. Now, the parents, the private eye, and the police in a dramatic confrontation surrounding the house, guns drawn. Inside, the teacher and the middle school student. They got in the bullhorn and said, Ms. Catherine Murray, she was now opening the, the door. Police. Houston police uh, opened the door. When we come back. The story that began in classroom 308 in this Houston middle school involving the 28-year-old married Ms. Murray and the student she met at 14 at the beginning of the school year was about to take yet another dramatic turn. The adopted boy who spoke not a word of English was getting help from her at the start of the year and soon much more inside that classroom. Prosecutors say she was writing love notes to the boy. Write with me. You're ready, my muse. I think we could create something amazing together. You are already my muse, she says. Yes. He's providing an illusion to him. He's giving him an, an, basically a fantasy. But now that fantasy was meeting reality. The teacher in a standoff with police, caught at her father's house with her teenage student inside. The home surrounded. Ms. Murray has no choice but to give herself up. Were you there? Yes. And she came out of that house? Yes. Oh yeah, we were there. Yeah, I we want to make there. sure she'd see us. Yeah. Was she in handcuffs? 
Oh, yeah. She was in handcuffs. Oh, yeah, yes. they had like 16 yes. police. Finally, for the parents, relief that Ms. Murray was locked up and away from Jimmy. But then the new challenge, a son who was falling into a dangerous depression, feeling he was the one guilty for putting the teacher there. Were you having suicidal thoughts? Yes, a lot. What were you thinking? That maybe if I was going to kill myself, they forgot about this. Um, you were thinking if you killed yourself, yeah. everyone would forget about this. Yes. Alex, what's the hardest part for you? You're dropping off your kid. It's a psychiatric ward. He's trying to kill himself. He believes his life is worthless. And you feel so helpless. It's a feeling that no parent should go through. Tonight, Jimmy says he's doing better, telling me he can finally smile again. Do you now see that there is a future? I know that there is a future. You know there's a future? Yes. And late this week, the future of Ms. Murray decided. Former teacher in Houston was sentenced. Former teacher in the Spring Branch ISD learned her fate today. That blonde teacher who the boys in school once thought was pretty, with a changed appearance, she's already pleaded guilty and now about to learn her fate. I think she crossed the line as far as you can go. It's a huge violation of trust. All of us as parents have a right to know that when we send our children to school, they're not just going to learn, they're going to be safe. The judge sentencing Ms. Murray. She'll spend one year in jail and then probation. She was told she cannot see Jimmy and she gave up her teaching license. She will also have to register as a sex offender. And then everyone in that courtroom saw that smile to her family as she left the court. And when Jimmy's parents sitting right there heard one year in jail, they were aghast. Had this been a 27-year-old man abusing a 15-year-old girl, the judgment there would have been completely different. What has she done to your son's life? I think it took his innocence away, because that was his first uh, time having sex. He uh, robbed him of his childhood. Ms. Murray, her family, and her defense team have repeatedly turned down requests from 2020 to talk about the case. They cite her ongoing treatment for bipolar disorder. Her attorney only saying this as he left the courthouse. We will respect the family's uh, request to keep this private, and that's, that's all we have to say. What's been the hardest part for you? It's like, <laughs> you had a boy with all the dreams, and then you have a boy thinking that his life is over. So instead of looking and going to a soccer game and be so happy, this is nothing in your life. We brought you here to be happy, to have a future. They have repeatedly told their son he should have never crossed that line and that regardless of what that teacher told him and wrote to him in those notes, none of it was right. Do you still love her? Yes. Yeah. In the same way? No. Do you think you'll see her again one day? Maybe. Tonight, with one year in jail for that teacher, there is still fear at Jimmy's house. Fear that the teacher, now getting divorced, will try to see their son again. That same teacher who first met Jimmy around the time this photo was taken, his first trip to NASA, in his first few weeks of school. That young face, now forever changed. And a mom who tonight says she will never give up trying to protect her son. And we don't know what is going to happen. And that's the biggest fear I have. Your biggest fear is that Oh yeah, that's the biggest. He is still a child and he was a child. And that's what we're asking for, justice. We thank those parents for sharing their story with us. And so what do you make of the sentence for that teacher tonight? Tweet me, use the hashtag ABC2020. And next year, the 2020 investigation tonight, hundreds of parents who put their trust in a fertility clinic just now finding out who really fathered their children when we come back. Next, the sperm donor scandal. A lab technician switching father's samples to his own DNA. This wasn't a mistake. This was done intentionally. When we return.
did a beautiful girl grow up with loving parents and have so little in common with them? Not their looks, not their skills, and that's just the start of a mystery now being solved and all leading back to a strange man in a fertility clinic. A man who could have deceived hundreds of families in the worst possible way. Here's Cecilia Vega. It started off as a hobby, researching family history. So it gets addictive. Yep, and um, boy, did I get bit by the bug. But what Pam Branham uncovered would reveal an unthinkable secret about her 21-year-old daughter. It involves a fertility clinic and a monster unleashed from the grave. Stunning story, bizarre story. They are warning others about Convicted felon. Convicted felon. It shakes your world, absolutely, because everything that you knew to be true all of a sudden wasn't. You know, you're like pinching yourself going, this is like the worst dream I've ever had. I'm going to wake up and it didn't happen. It happened. It happened. It happened in Salt Lake City. Newlyweds John and Pam Branham are trying to start a family with no success. So as a last resort, they go to a fertility clinic here on the campus of the University of Utah, a friendly lab. But something about the lab tech doesn't sit right with John. I remember handing him the sperm specimen and he gave me this just sort of evil smile, just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I thought, whoa. <laughs> John's reaction is soon forgotten, though, with the arrival nine months later of a beautiful baby girl, Annie. Couldn't have been happier. Not a creature was stirring. Flash through the years. First steps. Check the tree. I am dead. Look at her go. And the memories. She's musically inclined, and we always kind of wonder where that came from. Annie grows into a beautiful, bright young woman, a college whiz kid who studies astrophysics and surprises her parents with her gift for math. I barely made it through Calculus 1. Well, in Annie's second year of college, she was doing Calculus 3, making A's, and I'm thinking, there's a recessive gene at work there, <laughs> right? With her nest now empty, Pam picks up a hobby and gets hooked on researching the family tree. She'd be up to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, doing this. These days, anyone can stick a swab inside their cheek, go online, and for a few bucks, discover relatives and health histories they never knew they had. Pam Branham swabbed the whole family. I thought it was really interesting how it tells you about your health, it tells you where you come from. As expected, when the results come back, you can see how it's totally lit up. Pam finds that Annie shares 50% of her mom's DNA. But what about her dad? And it said that they shared zero DNA. I was in a panic. You know, I was in a complete panic. And he walked through the door, didn't say a word, gave me a big hug, started sobbing. I think it took a very long time for it to sink in. What was it that, that sunk in? Trying to comprehend what it meant that um, he wasn't my biological father and then who is. The Branhams say they couldn't get answers from the university. It would take a DNA detective to get to the bottom of it. They wanted to know what her biological heritage was on her paternal side. Finding biological fathers is a specialty of C.C. Moore, a genetic genealogist in Southern California. Desperate for answers, Pam sends her an email. This is right up my alley. She tells Pam to send Annie's DNA to multiple online databases. And in this type of work, we always say if we can find a second cousin or a predicted second cousin, we're pretty much in business. We can usually solve the case. Moore's hunch pays off, and the plot thickens with a single match between Annie's DNA and this total stranger in Minnesota, Carla Evans. What this retired school secretary knows will blow open the whole story. She asked me if I had a relative that might have donated sperm. And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And I said, well, can you tell me where he, he lives? And I said, well, he lived in Salt Lake City a lot. And I know he used to work for a fertility clinic there. And I thought, OK, that's it. That's it. That relative was Carla's cousin, Tom Lippert. Pam and Carla exchange photos, and suddenly, pieces of the puzzle start falling into place. When I first saw Annie's graduation picture, it looks almost identical to Tom's graduation picture. When I saw that photo, I just knew that Tom was the, the father. 
She also recalls some things that might explain Annie's interest in music and her college ambitions. Well, Tom was very talented. He was very uh, intelligent. He went to Notre Dame Law School. He was also musical. And I looked at those pictures and I recognized him. You recognized him? He was the man at the clinic. I could picture all those baby pictures behind him, the ones that he was so proud of. Oh, he made a big deal out of the fact that these were all the families that I've helped conceive. This is so creepy. Picturing him sitting next to that wall is chilling. And I just thought to myself, this wasn't a mistake. This was done intentionally. But the story dead ends in a cemetery. Tom Lippert died in 1999. Case closed. Until, that is, Carla Evans drops a bombshell. And said, Pam, there's something I need to tell you, and I want to be totally upfront with you about who my cousin was and what he did. Tom kidnapped this young woman. That's right. Tom Lippert was a convict, a kidnapper who gained national attention in 1975, sentenced to six years in prison for abducting a young woman. The details would unhinge everyone. He held her for three weeks, sometimes in a metal studded box. For me, that was as devastating almost as finding out. After getting out of prison, Lippert married a nurse, Jean, and settled in this quiet Salt Lake neighborhood. He terrorized the neighborhood kids. We were so scared we would walk on the other side of the road. Tessa Murdoch says Lippert threw rocks, broke windows, and even made the local news. Did you throw these rocks last night? Absolutely not. I never knew why he hated kids so much. Ironic, because hating kids didn't stop him from conceiving them, swapping his sperm for that of patients while working as a lab tech in the fertility clinic at the University of Utah. At the time, the clinic did not do criminal background checks on prospective employees. We are deeply sorry for any anxiety this has caused to our patients. Finally, this week, the university admitted that many lab records were destroyed. They can only guess how many sperm samples were handled or mishandled by Tom Lippert. Cases could soon be coming out of the woodwork. Let's just say a thousand might be an estimate of people who might be affected. DNA detective C.C. Moore created a blog that's already gotten responses from at least five more possible Lippert offspring, who'd be Annie's half-siblings. Do you think there are other families out there right now who were duped just like you? I know it. I know without a doubt. I'm starting to hear from them. I wouldn't wish this on any other family. Still, the Branhams know their turmoil is far outweighed by the one beautiful blessing that came out of it, their daughter, Annie. What have you learned about yourself, about your family? That we're just the same. My dad is my dad, regardless of whether or not he's biologically related to me. He's the one who raised me. When we return, Elizabeth Vargas speaking out for the very first time. I started thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll only drink, you know, on weekends. <laughs> I'll only drink, uh, you know, two glasses of wine a night. Battling and overcoming addiction. Next. And now a very personal note about my friend who is back with us after a brave journey. This morning, Elizabeth's return on Good Morning America. And we are thrilled to be welcoming back Elizabeth Vargas to ABC News. After bravely tackling a very personal struggle, she shared with viewers something she knows many families have also faced. You know, I guess the best way to do this is to get right to it. Mm -hmm. You're an alcoholic. I am. I am an alcoholic. It took me a long time to admit that to myself. It took me a long time to admit it to my family. Um, but I am. And I think part of the reason it's hard to admit is um, I had a lot of shame and a lot of guilt about it. it. must have taken so much effort to keep that secret. The amount of energy I expended keeping that secret and keeping this problem hidden from view, hidden from my family, hidden from friends, from colleagues, was exhausting. And when Elizabeth took time off to get help, her private battle suddenly became a very public one. I didn't choose to go public with this. Somebody else made that decision for me. But in hindsight and in retrospect, maybe it's a blessing because it, it relieves me of that secrecy. And um, 
that burden of walking around through life, living behind a facade, which is what you do. She says the alcoholism stems in part from another struggle, one that has shadowed her since child. Elizabeth's mother told me she remembers it too. Did you see the anxiety attacks as a little girl? Yes, I clearly saw them. And every morning when I would leave to go to work, she would cry and beg me not to go. And it was hard for her, it was heartbreaking for me. And it, her daddy was gone and she didn't want her mommy to leave. So I think the anxiety started then and probably carried with her forever in one form or another. Even with her steady hand at the anchor desk, Elizabeth now says the anxiety, the panic were always close behind. And at some point along the way, I dealt with that anxiety and with the stress that that anxiety brought by starting to drink. Um, and it slowly escalated and got worse and worse. I should have realized it was a problem way back when Zachary, my oldest son, was born. And he used to call my nightly glass of wine mommy's juice. And I thought that was hysterical. It didn't occur to me that that was a problem. And it didn't really get to be a huge problem until the last few years. And I actually started reporting on it. I've done like a half dozen 2020 hour long specials on drinking, specifically women in drinking and mothers in drinking. These women who opened their homes and their private lives to us, letting us in on the most intimate and embarrassing moments. Elizabeth says over time, she realized she shared something in common with many of the brave people she had interviewed. Uh, you make all sorts of deals with yourself. I started thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll only drink, you know, on weekends. <laughs> I'll only drink, uh, you know, two glasses of wine a night. I'll only drink, um, you know, I, I, I won't drink on nights before I have to get up and do Good Morning America. Um, but those deals never work, and you're only fooling yourself. Perhaps fooling herself, but she says not her husband, singer-songwriter Mark Cohn. My husband knew I had a problem. What did he say? You have a problem. You're, you're an alcoholic. And, and it made me really angry, really angry. But he was right. And it took me a long time to finally accept that. It took a long time. I mean, denial is huge for any alcoholic, especially for any functioning alcoholic. She says the denials all came to an end on a Saturday afternoon when she arrived at a shoot for work. When I got out of the car, I realized what am I doing? I am in no shape to do this. I need, and that's when I knew, I need to get help. I went to a rehab that specializes in treating trauma. They don't just deal with drinking or drug use, in the case of others there. Um, they deal with why you're drinking. What is it you're trying to cover up? What is it you're trying to numb? A devoted mom, she was very aware of the toll on her family, on her boys. And we explained that I was going away to, to get better and they came and visited me and they got to see where I was staying and meet the doctors there and ride a horse. <laughs> she came home before doctors wanted her to and soon realized she had more work to do. And I went back and finished and stayed until the doctors there said I was ready to come back. Um, and I, you know, this isn't what I want to be known for, um, but I'm really proud of what I did. And I feel so much better now, um, not having to walk around with this enormous burden. Always, always. And this evening, also watching her, her parents, mom and dad rooting for their daughter in her brave fight to get back. You've been with Elizabeth as she returns to, to work this week, and you've seen how all of us are, are quite proud of her. Uh, and I was just curious how a mom feels watching her return. Coming forward like this is not easy. And I think we're especially proud of that. You know, she said that she never wanted to be the face of this, but that if in doing this, she could help just one person out you there. You know, David, we heard from so many people after it became public what she was dealing with. We were really astonished. And uh, we're very proud of her for saying, I'm going to talk about it and tell people what I've been through, how it happened, and how I'm back here and then get back to work. Get back to work. In yeah. typical Elizabeth In fashion. In typical Elizabeth fashion, right, yeah. It's always embarrassing to have the entire world know your deepest, darkest secret. And yet at the same time, I think it'll be a relief. I think in the long term, it will be ultimately a blessing because I can be free about it. I'm not hiding anymore and that's hard, but it's also a relief. 
so that you can be free about